And so this workshop is called Teaching Children and Teens uh, with really the main focus of how can we as a church uh, reach young people. And now one of the things that I have found is oftentimes we talk about reaching young people, but if we get them in the doors, we have to know what to do when they're here, right? And one thing I've learned is not every church is either equipped to deal with a group of young people or even really know how. Now, with that said, everyone's different. Everyone has their own uh, different type of experience. We have all have um, you know, been put different places as far as what churches either we grew up. I don't know. Has anyone, grew, has anyone grown up in this church? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, so you, you, you have the experience of you know, knowing this area, knowing this church. We're all, we're all different. We all have different backgrounds. But I just want to be a help and a blessing to you today as we look at this, really the need, I believe, as far as reaching young people. And I'd like to just turn our attentions again to those verses we read, which you could just uh, listen. But in Ecclesiastes 12.1, we, we read it this morning, but it says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And in that, we know that Solomon is talking about uh, seeking God, acknowledging God, really serving God now in, in our days of our youth, rather than waiting, at, because the reality of waiting is we age. How many of you have noticed that we age? All right, aging process is, is a real thing, right? It is real. And so the emphasis that even Solomon has was start now, right? Like we talked about our, a lot of our youth evangelism, evangelism emphasis, whoo, talking about t- tongue twisted, um, is to encourage them to start now. But we have to really know uh, just some things as far as reaching them. What does it look like? What are some things we should know? What are some things that when we're actually going to put the boots on the ground and start to teach and train young people, what does that look like? So I have some helpful things here. Now, I do apologize. For some reason, uh, my formatting got messed up right before I printed it. So uh, please um, be gracious as you read there. And if there's, it's not too bad, but there are some uh, spacing um, issues there. But I, I think we still have the information. So, uh, so it should be should be all right. But it starts off by way of introduction, talking about a little bit of my experience of how I found it, where you are going to be teaching uh, different types of, of groups. Now, you'll notice in the notes that I kind of use the word teaching and preaching kind of interchangeably. Um, a lot of uh, when this was written and a lot of um, times when I would teach this workshop, it would be to young preachers. And so you might say, well, I, th- none of this pertains to me. It has the word preaching. No, what we're talking about is communicating to young people, right? Whether by way of preaching or teaching. And so a little bit as far as my background, I have been in youth ministry uh, really since, since I was 16. When I was 16, I started working on a bus route over there in Youngstown. And then um, I was very active with, uh, in our youth group, helping with our youth group. I served as a uh, junior counselor and counselor for camp. And then I worked as a uh, ministry intern at my camp. I, I told you a little bit about that this morning. I say my camp, but my church. And so I have really been around a lot of different ministries because when I was in Michigan, we had the unique ministry of helping churches start youth ministries. And so I was technically the youth director of three churches um, all at one time. And that was, um, I believe, in about 2015, 2016. Uh, we did that for about two years. And then really what the goal would be is we'd come in, we'd help a church with their youth group, and then we'd try to hand it off either to someone the church might be able to hire as far as a youth director, youth pastor, or someone in the church that wanted to work in a larger role with the young people and kind of fill the void. And so we've done that uh, multiple times. We did it three times in Michigan. And then we've done it about, I think, two times since we've been back in the area. One, one church in Pennsylvania we worked with uh, started a youth group, group really from the ground. We started with zero, uh, but the, praise the Lord, we were able to uh, see the Lord bring us people. And we uh, handed that over when they did hire a youth pastor. And um, the, just a couple weeks ago, they had about 18 teenagers. So we, we praise the Lord for that. And then we've held churches, a couple churches in Ohio, 
as well, start some, some youth groups and, and bring some young people in. And so I just say that to say, um, and I'm not trying to puff myself up this morning or this afternoon, evening, whatever it is, right? Sun's still out, I guess. But, uh, you know, we talked about pride this morning, so that's not something I'm trying to do. But I would like you to know that I, I believe the Lord has given me some experience where I've seen some things, been around some things. And the reality is that there's a lot of different types of people, whether it be age group or whether it be the area, area that you're in. So it says here in our notes, I want to help you in understanding these groups that we can be most effective and can... Um, as that we can be most effective in that setting. So when you look at the life of Christ, the way that he preached, and how true is this? The way that he preached with different groups of people, uh, he, the parables he used, the way he communicated, the way that he taught, he was always aware of his group of people. Isn't that amazing? Uh, sometimes we don't always catch that because there's a lot of times, if you're like me, you read quickly and you don't always grasp. That's why when I study, I have to go go over. <laughs> you go over it want to make sure I didn't read, read too quickly. But Jesus definitely had, had this ability in his ministry where he, was, he would acknowledge the type of crowd he was talking to. And so I want us to look over these groups and hopefully give us some insight today, which the first group is children. Now, you see letter A there, and you might giggle, it is very true, but it's harder to keep the attention of children than any other group of people you ever preach to or teach to, right? It is hard. How many of you have ever had that experience, either teaching or preaching young people, okay, uh, or to children? Yes, their attention span is uh, very short, right? And you have to keep, keep their attention, and that's why uh, a lot of times, and now just, just so everyone's aware me and your pastor didn't like have a powwow, and he said, "Here's the people that can do this, and here's the people." That... I have I have no idea. And one of the the reasons we're doing this just is to help and encouragement. It's not that um, uh, I think everyone's doing a horrible job at whatever, right? It's just the the reality of children's ministry is not everyone is able to keep the attention of a child. Right? Not everyone even knows how. Now, I, I believe we can work at it and learn some principles to do it, but the, really the first step is to acknowledge that children do have um, that, that difficulty with attention and that they are the most difficult group when it comes to that. And I think one of the helpful things with realizing that is to not get angry or upset with them. Now, I'm not saying let them hang from the chandelier and like, well, their attention span. Obviously, you don't want them to do that. But how often can you not get frustrated when they keep looking the other way or they keep fiddling with something or maybe they'll keep whispering? Uh, just be gracious and merciful and realize that's their attention span. It's just going to be something you're going to have to work through. And so there are times where you have to do um, object lessons to keep their attention. There are times where you have to, to uh, repeat yourself, right? And so even letter B, it says you must become a great storyteller or you'll be tied up and beaten before you know what happened, right? And so really what that means is if you are trying to communicate a story, uh, communicate your lesson to a child, um, you have to keep their, do your best to keep their attention. Now, I've seen it to where I've seen people teach children. I've, I've seen people uh, teach adults, too, where they didn't necessarily care if they were keeping your attention because uh, sometimes the thought is, well, if you don't pay attention, that's on you, right? That, that's on you. That's your fault. You should be doing what's right and, and paying attention. Well, with children, it just doesn't work that way, right? And so there are times where whatever lesson it is or whatever curriculum you're using, whatever the message you're trying to relay, sometimes you have to put it more in a story form or put it in a way where you'll realize, like, hey, I could get their attention. One of the things that, that preachers use, which... Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard you preach, brother. I know I've heard uh, b bits and snippets here and there because I, I follow your church and live stream and things. But as far as illustrations, there's some pastors that use a lot of them, some of them that don't use many. Where, where would you fall? Uh, I'm towards the lighter end. Lighter end, okay. Uh, but if you're going to use it, it's usually because you're trying to get them to picture something, visualize something, relate with something. Children appreciate that as well. 
right, where you're trying to say, well, you know what, this is what I'm trying to communicate, so maybe if I tell them a story, or maybe it's even something that happened in your life, or there is a, a story that kind of uh, hints towards that direction, it could, be, it could be helpful. And you definitely don't want to end up tied up and, you know, beaten up <laughs> by, by, by the children. Um, then letter C, uh, now th- this is, I say you should, but Um, A lot of the notes here are kind of compiled by uh, multiple different workshops we've had, and I've kind of put it all in this category. So I know it says you should, but a lot of it is more so just a suggestion. So I I don't want you to leave and say, he said I should do this, but I can't do this. Or It's just a suggestion or just something at least to keep it in the back of your mind. But it says you should move around a lot, so they have to guess what you are going to do next. And it really is a helpful tool, something that really no one really necessarily told me to do. I guess the more you do something, you kind of catch on. But especially, let's say I'm, I'm teaching you guys a lesson, and I love the fact there's candy here. I don't know how you keep yourself from not, which I guess it is good because you can't preach with a sucker in your mouth. So um, it, it does show some restraint. You do a good job preaching, you get some. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I already took some. <laughs> That's great. Um, but if I'm teaching you, and let's say you're, just pretend you're children for a moment, right? And let's say I'm holding these lollipops. My uh, three-year-old call, calls them lollipops. Uh, but I'm holding these lollipops, these suckers. And let's say I'm telling you a story and I'm talking and I have these in my hands. Do I have your attention? Especially with kids, right? They're like, what's he going to do with those lollipops? <laughs> right? Is he going to give them to me? Now, I'm not saying teach all the time with lollipop, but a, just a good way to hey, I'm going to get your attention. I have something in my hand, and maybe there's something that can relate, you know, object lesson, you know, to, to um, you know, lollipop, right? Now, even that, though, maybe you are going to give a lollipop to someone that listens best. Right? That, that's not wrong to do, especially with children. I've heard people just say, well, if they were trained right, they wouldn't need, you know, a candy to motivate them. Well, not every child, especially when you're talking about lost children. You're talking about lost families, a lot of children are not going to have a good upbringing. And so that's where really the, the mercy part of it comes in and the graciousness where you're like, you know what, I'm going to realize that sometimes this could be a helpful tool, right? And I'm not just saying just a holding candy, but even just the fact of, of moving around, right? If I'm um, just moving, they're like, oh man, you know, where, what is he going to do? What's he going to go? Keep, keeps their attention a little bit. Because even just standing in one place, now, again, it's different with adults. When I preach, I rarely leave the pulpit. I just learned that I, it helps me to keep focus. A lot of times if I leave the pulpit, I get super distracted, and all of a sudden I'm talking about something, you know. But if I'm talking to kids, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different because usually your message is a little simpler when you're trying to really get a point across. But moving around can, can be helpful. Again, to just have that realization that kids aren't going to sit still, and so... Maybe you don't need to sit still either, right? Maybe move around a little bit. Now, I'm not saying you all walk around in a circle in your room, right? But just kind of move around. Be, be willing to do something to kind of help get their attention. Now, again, if you're not able to do that, that's not the only way to help keep your attention, but it's just a helpful, a helpful tip. But then letter D, and I already alluded to it, but be short and to the point. 15 to 20 minutes is usually a good time with children. Um, remember, outlines are meaningless. Now, I just heard yet uh, one of the, it was yesterday. It's been a long weekend for us. We did our, our youth conference, so I, I've heard a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching in a very short amount of time. So I'm either teaching my lesson or someone else's. I don't know. Uh, but I heard it said that um, outlines, uh, an alliterated outline is more for the preacher than the person. Uh, I don't know. How often do you alliterate? Most? 50-50. 50, 50, Okay. But we were talking about it because we, we had a practical workshop for young preachers talking about preparing to preach. And you can, you, know, you can alliterate, that's fine, but you don't have to because at the end of the day, most church people don't shake the pastor's hand at the end and said, I love the alliteration there. Wow, I love the use of the, the A's or the R's. or the Not everyone's going to pay attention to that, right? So it's not really for the person that's helped to organize their mind and stuff like that. And so when you're teaching children, you don't have to have a... Three-point outline, alliterated, you know, um, all of these fancy things in your outline. Outline really with children, it's meaningless. You, you, you want your one point of what you're te- teaching them, 
and get it across. Now again, depends on what the curriculum you're using and everything. I'm not saying don't use curriculum, but we need to realize what we're trying to teach the child and do our best to teach it, right? Because if we worry so much, we're like, well, the book says it like this. I, I'm one of the worst out of teaching out of a book because I have to scan it, pick out what we're, trying, what, what we're trying to say, what are the important verses here, and so I usually just focus on that. But when I go, like, just even the way we're doing now, we're going letter A, B, C, D, that's going to be hard to really go through with a child. And here's something I hear a lot. Well, they're in school every day. They should be able to do, you know, this or that. Well, first of all, especially if you're going to have a child in, on a Sunday, uh, they're just wired different on a Sunday morning. They just are. Because they just had Saturday yesterday, right? Uh, and so they're already out of whack with their calendar. Sunday's their last day before school. So you might say, well, they sit in school. They should act this way. You know, they, they should be used to it. Well, that's just not the case. And especially, they're not going to treat church like, like school. And I'm not saying not to have structure and not to have rules, but to realize that they're going to learn a little bit differently on a Sunday morning. Because let's be honest, and really a lot of it's depending on whenever you do something with children and with teens. But let's be honest, we're not always our sharpest on Sunday morning, are we? No, Sunday mornings sometimes are hard, especially for a preacher or pastor. I mean, sometimes if, if we wake up sleepy and in the fog, we can't just sleep in. <laughs> we still got to go, right? We, we still have to try, try our best. And so even preachers deal with that. Our children are definitely going to uh, deal with that as well. So be short, to the point. Don't you like when the pastor does that with you as an adult? Sure you do, right? And, but especially with a child, you have to, like, I sometimes have the style that I did it a little bit this morning, but when I'm preaching, and let's understand, preaching and teaching are a little bit different. I believe preaching should have a little bit of both in it. But when you're, you're teaching, you're, again, what's the message? Get it, you know, get it across. Now, there's a lot of times when I preach, uh, someone uh, told me it's kind of like a like a sniper, where I, I get, I lay out the land, I, 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 I find the target, and you know, I do all the prep, and, and in the message, we're getting to that target, and then all of a sudden, I shoot, right? And so, a lot of times, most of the message is towards, towards the end. Doesn't really work with a child, does it? Yeah, they, they want the message, if you're laying out this big, elaborate way of getting to the ending, uh, you already lost them, right? So, uh, that, that's part of the point of Keeping it short is simple, to the point. Letter E, if you can have any visuals and props, it would be better for you in your preaching, teaching, effectiveness. Again, don't mind my, my use of preaching. We're, we're talking about teaching this morning, and um, that's, again, I use it interchangeably. But how, how often do you and I as adults, and even teenagers in the room, young adults, how often do we appreciate visuals? Yeah, sometimes it changes, changes the game, right? Uh, which I guess I should have brought a visual to really <laughs> keep your guys' attention, right? Um, but visuals really help with children. And so, and probably something you, you, you already know, right? We realize that. But it is good sometimes that maybe if you understand what your crowd will be, your, the age group you have, and to try to prepare uh, somewhat of a visual. Now, before I move on, does anyone have any... Um, do you mind if I make it more? No. Okay. Um, as far as with children, does anyone have any thoughts or anything to add with that? As far as zeroing in on that, that age group? Okay. Well, we'll move to teens then. Teens, uh, they're a little different than children, aren't they? Well, mo most of the time, right? Uh, but letter A, which hey, I put the, I'm distracting myself already with these lollipops... Uh, letter A, teens love stories. Now, again, not everyone's funny, right? But this is ju just a, um, a suggestion, right? The funnier you, funnier you are, the better you will do with them. So you might say, well, that takes me out of working with the teens. I'm not funny at all. Well, teens, even though they like it when you try to be funny, it doesn't mean you're actually funny. A lot of times, I, I'm pretty good at getting teenagers to laugh but usually because it was something dumb, something silly, right? It doesn't mean I'm a comedian, right? Sometimes I tell my wife, you know, I'm just going to go be a comedian. She's like, you're not funny, right? I'm like, but they were all laughing, right? So don't think you have to be a comedian or like, you're like, I, I don't, I'm not funny. Trying to be fun oftentimes translates into being funny, 
right? And so what I'm trying to say by that is if you tell a story, and sometimes, especially as adults, we want to leave out, especially if you're telling a story about yourself, you want to leave out something embarrassing. Well, sometimes something embarrassing is funny, right? And so a lot of that involves you being able to be transparent with them and just being real and just being in this mindset of I'm going to connect with them, and if I'm going to be a little embarrassed, embarrassed, but they're going to laugh. Now, obviously not to share all the details with them, but if you share, if you spilled some coffee on your shirt and you're trying to cover it up, you tell them a story like, hey, you know, this is what happened today. I spilled coffee on my shirt. They're probably going to laugh, right? Um, I actually, it happened to me with the church, and they, uh, it wasn't young people, but man, they could not get over my story of spilling coffee on myself. I think they still bring it up when I come in there. Um, but even just being willing to tell some stories, or even sometimes maybe you have to look up some stories to, to try to connect and get, get their attention. Um, teens want someone who would challenge them, but also understands their sense of what is funny. I've been around people who say, well, if we're in church, if we're in youth group, if we're in Sunday school, we have to be serious. Well, I think that there has to be a sense of seriousness, right, where we have to take what we're doing. It's a serious matter. Proclaiming the gospel is a serious matter. But it's okay sometimes in, with the goal of connecting with someone to allow yourself to not take yourself so seriously. Have you ever been around someone that takes themselves way too seriously? Yeah, I, and teenagers do not connect with that well when someone takes themselves way too seriously and you can't laugh you can't have fun we have to learn teenagers appreciate um, that lightheartedness of being able uh, to just have have a sense of humor uh, have you ever had to say that to, to someone uh, that's a, an adult where you have to say where's your sense of humor right where you laugh about something and they're like well I don't find that funny well, come on where's your sense of humor right and again depending on the day we're all different but if you're trying to connect with teens, if the goal is to reach teens, we have to understand that they do enjoy, again, those stories, trying to be funny, just trying to connect with them, not taking everything too seriously. Um, but again, there's balance to that, right? Because I've been around youth groups where it's all just funny and it's all just joking and then there's nothing learned at all. We're like, well, we connected with them, but they have to learn something, right? There has to be a balance. So connect with them, be funny, be transparent, connect with them, but drive the message home, right? And that's, that's the thing. You're not trying to do it to get them to like you. You're trying to do it to, so that they can learn, so they could grasp something. And so let her see... Or letter B, I'm sorry. Never base the whole sermon or lesson on a happy or sad story. You do not want the, the teen making a decision based on their emotions only on, on that moment. Uh, this was called sensationalism and is not right to practice on teens. And so, again, with that, there's balance. If you notice this morning, I told a story about myself. Now, I've done that with uh, teenagers before, and, and depending on the crowd, the story, uh, I give a little bit more details or less details depending on the crowd with the, my story of rolling a four-wheeler down a cliff. The reason why I use that story, I believe the Lord gave that to me. It wasn't something I chose to do, right? I didn't say, let me just roll this four-wheeler down a cliff. I believe it happened, and God worked in it so that I have a story to tell. But I can really manipulate that story if I'm really trying to get a decision, right? If I'm trying to get, if I know there's people in the room that they, they, need, to be, they, they need to be saved, now, don't misunderstand me here, but I can really manipulate a person to want to get saved, but they need to be saved. Does that make sense? Like, man, you could scare somebody. You're like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get saved. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, right? No, you don't want to necessarily scare someone. You don't want to necessarily, if you're saying, you know what, I'm going to tell this really happy story so everyone feels happy afterwards. Well, that's, that's not the goal. Same thing with the, the sad. And I've been in a place before where they told a, a pretty emotional story. Then at the end, they laid a rope at the, the altar and said, all right, if, you're, you know, if you truly love this or that, you'll cross this line. And man, every teenager is getting up and across the line. They're crying and, and they're weeping. And listen, I think 
maybe there was some positive things that happened after that, but I just know in my youth group, they came back to me crying and weeping. They crossed the line, and I asked them later, okay, so what did you learn? They're like, I don't know. I just felt like I should cross the line. Why? Because they told a story that went to those senses, to that emotions. And so, again, it might not be something that's too applicable to you and, and what you're looking at doing, uh, but I know you, you as a church are trying to do youth rallies, right? Uh, that That's helpful to know that you know we're not trying to play with their emotions we're just teaching them from the bible and we're going to be clear and we're going to be real and we're not going to try to manipulate i don't know about you but i i've been in situations where people have tried to manipulate me before right try to work on my emotions and 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 make me do something and the thing is if you make people especially at that youth rally which i understand you guys how long have you guys been doing youth rallies like that Uh, okay i know you guys take turns and everything right Okay, yeah, that's wonderful. I love that you guys are doing that. Uh, but youth rallies can easily be a way, uh, and I, again, I've, I've already told you that story, where we try to manipulate the situation, either get more uh, decisions or, or whatever it is, but uh, that can definitely definitely be dangerous. So something just to be o- aware of, and the last part of that says these kinds of decisions that are made in those moments do not usually last very long. That's why, you know, that's something we struggle with at camp. We try our hardest not to manipulate emotions and feelings because, yes, it looks great for a picture that the altars are flooded, but I only want them to come to the altar if God's actually doing something in their heart, not because they feel pressured or feel like they should. And, in fact, we had something happen at camp. I understand this is, is live stream. I won't give too much information, but we had a medical emergency. And we had to decide, and a lot of it was learning experience. We learned a lot of things, learned some procedures that we really needed to kind of work on. And just one of those things that you never think you have to de- de- go through or deal with. But um, I know we are definitely more prepared for it this next time. But it was a medical emergency, and it was just a rough, rough night. Uh, there was a lot of emotions, a lot of things happening. And there was the question of, it was Thursday, we were supposed to end camp on Saturday, but that was the only week, other weeks of camp end on Friday. And so we were trying to decide, should we end Friday morning because of what happened? And at first I'm like, no, like we're going to keep going, you know, we're, it's fine. But then I realized sometimes there are certain people, certain preachers, sometimes even, you know, counselors. There are times where people, and it, it was at the time, uh, a life and death situation, okay? And so I just did not feel, and there were other, other reasons, this wasn't the only reason, but there was this thought in my, my head, and I believe the Lord really pointed out to me, is people can abuse that situation and try to use it for other people to make a decision, right? Like, what if that person died? And, it, you know, I just didn't want it to become that. Now, one of the reasons was just because of the specific details to the situation. Uh, I, I do believe there are, there's some type of place for that. But I just didn't want anything to be manipulated. But also, my staff was exhausted, brother, after what, what, what we kind of went through. So I'm like, you know what? We're going to end and it's fine. And, and the Lord definitely blessed. People were saved that week. It was a good week. But sometimes you have to be aware of, you know what? I don't want to make them feel pressured or manipulate them uh, into anything. I want them to fully grasp it. And that one of the reasons why we're even having a workshop like this, because the reality is sometimes we can get kids in the church and we could get teens in the church, but why don't they stay? Right? Why don't they stick? I don't know if you've noticed that. I've noticed that where we get them and they come for a season and maybe they don't keep coming or whatever it is. Sometimes they move, sometimes parent situation. But what I've noticed with teenagers a lot of times they get serious about God, but then 18 comes around and they're not, they're not back. I think a lot of that is because maybe some of the decisions they've made or told, were told they made weren't actually real. Life-changing decisions last, don't they? And so we want to find real decisions. We want to help them make real, real decisions. So let us see. Uh, treat them like adults, making sure they know uh, that you don't look down on them and truly believe that God can use them. We, I know we don't have too much, more, too much more time, but let me just say, I've seen a lot of different churches treat teenagers as a nuisance, treat them as a pest, because, let's, let's be honest, uh, depending on the teenagers and the group that you bring in, um, there's usually at least two or three of them that come from a rough home life, that aren't very respectful, they're rowdy. And some of them are just hyper. Some of them are not bad, bad kids per se as far as what they do, but they're just hyper, and so they seem bad. 
You know what I mean? Because, and, and the reality of our, the, the world we live in today, there's a lot of different diagnoses, right? The ADD, ADHD, all those different things. A lot of those things, um, and uh, we can have a debate again. I, I don't know everything. Uh, you, your pastor and I just, just met. We talk, talked um, a few times, but we just met. I know there are some people that believe different things when it comes to medication and things like that. But the reality of it is there are some kids that are going to be heavily medicated, and there are going to be some kids that actually the medication does help. And sometimes they come and they weren't on their, 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 their medicine. And so, and again, I'm, I'm being very vague, so I don't want you to think, well, you think everyone should be medicated. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is a lot of times kids come in with issues and we treat them not as let us still try to teach you God's word. Let us share the gospel with you. Let us train you, help you, invest in you. It can easily be especially because we're adults. We take ourselves seriously, right? We want to look the right way, dress the right way, sound the right way. That teenager is not respecting this church. I don't want them coming here anymore. Well, we ha- if we truly want to reach our communities, we can't have that attitude all the time, right? Now, again, there's, ba- there's balance. We, we can't, I'm not saying let them come in and just destroy your property and be like, well, we have to let them, you know. No, there has to be balance. There have to be things addressed. But when they come in, don't treat them like, a pest. Don't treat them like a kid. Treat them like an adult. Like, hey, I'm, I'm happy you're here. Don't say, well, you, no, you can't step in that. That's the adult Sunday school room. I don't want you to mess it up. No, they, they could come in, right? Treat them like an adult. Treat them like someone that can make a decisions. And then two, if you think of it that way, do you let an adult usually get away with acting crazy? And no, there's accountability there too, right? So rather than just uh, all of a sudden and right away or immediately is the word I'm looking for, immediately just judging and condemning them, give them a chance but hold them accountable, right? Just like what we do with, typically with, with adults, at least I believe, I believe we do, right? Um, I believe we're on letter C, or yeah, treat them like adults, letter D. Now, I know this is worded a little di- different, but make sure to go after their stinking sin. Uh, make, make sure that you're not trying too hard to be their friend, not trying too hard to be, uh, be uh, funny, but realize that they, first of all, they need to be saved, and they need to realize they're sinners, right? Uh, teenagers don't always like that, right? But we don't always like that when someone calls us a sinner, but you, the sin has to be addressed. And especially, uh, we're talking about all, all those, those, those teens that come in, they have issues, they have problems, Sin has to be addressed, right? Yeah, there's some things that they're, they're dabbling in and show them from the Word of God what tells them about their sin, right? And isn't it amazing, though, we have a God that the, the Bible says that all we have to do is confess our sin and He's faithful and just to for, forgive us. And so I'm not saying, like, you guys are wicked and horrible and, you know, well, no, like, hey, here's your sin issue. Here's something I notice you're doing, I notice you're in, but here's what the Bible says about it. But there's forgiveness, right? But don't let them slide like, well, I want them to like me. I'm not going to preach about this sin. Or one of the realities is we do have uh, the reality of the whole gender, gender issue. Um, You know, uh, there are going to be young people, like it or not, they're going to come in and they're struggling with that. They're going to come come in and they say that these are my pronouns, right? What do we do? Oh, they can't come. No, sure they can come. Right? Because they need to learn. They need, need to teach them. And listen, if they don't, if they, they say, well, I strongly disagree. My family doesn't teach us it. Then maybe there could be another church that can, can help them. But we have to at least try, right? If the Lord brings them, uh, brings them through, through our doors. But we have to show them through the Bible what the Bible says. And let's be honest. And again, I'm not saying to let, let people go on things. But let's be honest. There are some churches that, uh, there are affirming churches, meaning we're not going to point out your sin. Whatever you do, we're going to affirm it. You're, you're fine. We're not going to teach that. But then when someone does come in and they have those sins, you still have to say what the Bible says about it. But there is, and I, I've had this happen to me before. Well, I don't want to mention this because I know they're okay with it and I don't want to offend them. No, we, 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 have, to, we have to go after the sin, right? or we have to address the sin. That way they can find some, find some help. But we have to... Uh, again, the way it's kind of worded, uh, we have to do it in a loving way, right? The emphasis is just the fact that, like, man, they can find some help if they get rid of that, that sin they're struggling with, right? But kind of 
moving on and about nine more minutes. Is that, is that all right? Or are we already passed? Okay, okay. Um, teaching young people. So we've gone to the already looking at the type of groups and what's helpful with them and the kind of tips and tricks with the different age groups as far as children and teen. And those are the age groups we're focusing in on because in the introduction, you know, uh, I, I have it to where talking to older people, uh, you know, in nursing homes and different things like that. So we're only honing in on the children and teens today. So when you're actually going to be teaching them, I have to realize every child needs to know that you are sincere. That goes a long way with children and teenagers, knowing that you are sincere and that you are, you are real. A young person can spot a fake a mile away. Get your heart right with, or get your heart right so you have a burden for them uh, before you go to class, before you go to church. Wherever the young person is going to be that you're going to either teach or help, uh, make sure you're going to be real with them. Don't make it I'm doing this because I was told to. I'm doing this because the pastor asked me to, or the pastor told me to, right? It's because I actually care about them, and I'm going to be sincere and real with them. Uh, don't teach to point out their weaknesses. You must uh, teach to strengthen them. goes back to the stereotypes we put on to teens, where sometimes we can just get to the point where we're really hard on them, pointing out all, all of the horrible, wicked things teenagers do, all the horrible, wicked things children do. Well, it's not just about pointing out the bad things they do, but it's about strengthening them and helping them, right? Because I've heard some people rant about teens, and man, the things people can say, right? Now, saying, I, I think we should watch what we say, right? It shows where our heart is, but especially if you're going to say that to teens, are you going to reach them? You guys are always on your phone. You guys are never respectful. You guys are always late. You guys are, what's that doing, right? Uh, and uh, you could do some of that to be uh, funny, right? But, but if it's in the right kind of, um, if it's in the right heart and right attitude, but just showing them their weaknesses, they need to know how they can be strengthened, helped. A child or a teen already feels inadequate. That's really important to know, especially talking about, we, we gave some of the, st the statistics this morning. Most people come from a broken home. Most kids don't have a father figure in their home or a father figure at all. They already feel like no one loves them. A lot of them are already going to feel like there's no place for them in this world. And if they come here and feel unwelcomed, what other choice do they have in life? Well, who else is going to help them? So never make them feel inadequate by just pointing out their problems and their issues. No, point out the fact that you love them. You're happy they're here. And how can they find help and strength today, right? And so they're already dealing with feeling that way. Children and teens know when you are stuck preaching or teaching to the class, the club, the chapel, whatever. Have you ever got that call on a, maybe a Saturday night, hey, I need you to fill in teaching. Or, hey, I need you to do this. Or maybe it's a week before, so-and-so so is going to be out of town. Can you teach this class? Sometimes that will happen. And so when Sunday morning rolls around, just say, well, I wanted to hear the guest speaker today, but I'm stuck with you guys. Your teacher's sick. I was the only other one. Let's get through this. You're not going to accomplish anything. You might as well have just said no and not had class that day, Right. Because if you make them feel like you're, that you're stuck with them, um, you've already lost them. Okay? And I think we've all been in a situation before where you felt like someone was just stuck with you. How did you feel about that? Right? You, you didn't feel like they actually cared. And usually, if you feel that you're stuck with a class or stuck with a group, you should probably get the heartbeat on how much you care. Right? Because we, we shouldn't feel like we're stuck with them. We should feel we have an opportunity uh, to help. Now, let the group you are preaching or teaching to burden your heart before you teach. Um, it says here, I like to um, sit down, analyze the people, to kind of look at them. Now, this, this is more in a, a aspect of uh, guest preaching somewhere, right, where it's helpful for a preacher uh, kind of look at the crowd, kind of get an idea of who he's teaching, preaching to. But with you, um, it might be more applicable as far as the junior church or Sunday school. Uh, picture, picture the kids before you teach 
Or maybe while you're stuttering, or stuttering, studying, while you're studying, picture their faces. Try to realize, like, man, so and so, I, I, I know they're dealing with this. I know they're dealing with that. Make it, make it real to them. Make it to where you are burdened and heartbroken and want to help them. And so it says, by, by once you do that, by the time I teach them, I already love them and care. Right. So love them and care before you teach. Right. And because let's be honest, especially when you get new kids and you teach them like, oh, I don't think I like that kid. Right. Like, no, try to try to realize the fact that, hey, I, I'm going to try to connect with them even before I start teaching and care before I start teaching them. Now, again, every situation is different. You might not always get that opportunity. But I think if that's in the back of our minds, I think it could really be a help to us uh, when we teach. Uh, number four, uh, never, never teach while under the uh, influence. Now, that's not necessarily talking about drugs, alcohol. Really what that is talking about is the attitude. Um, there are, are times, and it says there, one, one kid in a rotten attitude can change your demeanor, attitude, or even your message. I, preacher, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, I know at least once, but I'm sure there's times where you get up here, someone just said something to you right before service. That never happens, right? Someone said something right before service, or you had a conversation Saturday, and you got to get up here, and you have to try to decide, am I going to preach exactly what God wants me to, or can I rant about someone, but in a pseudo way where they don't know, right? Like, people shouldn't be doing this, and you're talking about what they just did to you, right? We shouldn't have this attitude, and you're talking about someone's attitude, right? And there are times where you walk in, maybe a kid kicks you in the shin, or maybe a teen says something rude to you, and all of a sudden, we're going to talk about manners today, right? You're under the influence now. Your demeanor changed, your attitude changed, because we have to realize that it is a tough task te- 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 teaching and training teens, and it is tough to always keep our composure. But man, as soon as you're mad with that group, maybe you should just have a, a, a time where you uh, share some prayers and maybe spend some time praying or get, spend some more time getting to know them to, so that you're not teaching a message in a way where you're frustrated, disgusted, mad, nothing good's going to come out of that. So if you have a group where you just get upset and they get under your skin, man, do not use that as a time to, to teach something negative, right? We want to be in the spirit, don't we? We want the spirit to control what we do and what we say. And so there are times we're just going to have to be uh, ready for that. But moving on quickly, uh, teach with understanding. You won't understand all the intricacies of what, hap- what has happened to them every week or every time, but teach with an understanding heart. And that really goes th- with a lot of what we said. But if we understand, like, we can't expect them to be their best version on a, it, whatever Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Friday night youth rally, we have to teach with being understanding. N- never judge or prejudge a teenager or a group of teenagers. You know, we already kind of hit on that. Um, and then kind of the, the next few, and we'll, we'll kind of, for sake of time, kind of walk through this. Um, but there's times where there's a mix between children and teens. It's best to focus on the teens and not um, forget about the children. Uh, so t- that's some of the times you can put in the whole visual aspect of it to keep the children uh, involved. Always make the message easy enough for both groups. Uh, the children will look, look up to the teen, teens and follow them, so you must aim to affect the teens so as to affect the children. So if the teens are, are in it and you're keeping their attention, you're probably going to keep the kids' attention too because a lot of times if it's a mixed group, I don't know why, but they think teenagers are amazing, right? Kids are like, oh, I want to be like that. So um, d- don't put the message so low to the children, leave out the teens. Oftentimes, if you're, you're working at keeping at the teen level, you'll be able to, to keep the, the children in as well. And again, that, that's just a suggestion and opinion. Um, do with that as you would. Um, and then dealing with teens and adults together, that's something you can uh, uh, read as, uh, some other time, but it is helpful to, to try to have to uh, deal with that. You might not ever have to do that. Uh, but no matter how many, this is number three, no matter how many of these groups are together at one time, you must always remember several things. One, be prepared for the occasion. Do not go over the allotted time given. Always make sure you have an application for them to apply the message to their own own life. And then number four, kind of going with what we talked about this morning, stay humble, right? Stay humble after the results or stay in, encouraged after the adult, the results. So whether you have a group of 20 to 30, stay humble, right? You didn't do it. God did it. But if you have a group of four, two, sometimes one, stay encouraged, right? 
And so we'll end with some verses here. Keep in mind we're dealing with students. Uh, Mark 6, 34 says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Now, the big, one of the big aspects of all of this that we're talking about, teaching teens, children, we as the adults, as the teacher, as the Christian, we need to have compassion. Jesus had compassion over people, and he taught them. That's what I love about Jesus, is he never, he never was in a situation where people asked him questions, and he said, you don't know that? Get away from me. Right. Never. So let us not be that way. Jesus had compassion. He realized, hey, they need help. There's their situation, so I'm going to bring myself down to their level and to help them get out of that situation. And so... Uh, that's I think needs to be in our mind of having these bi- biblical principles. We must put in action to our uh, compassion and teach them as much Bible as we can, just as Jesus did. Uh, Second uh, Timothy three fifteen, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now. We'll end with that. Uh, towards the end of this, I, I have songs for children. I don't, you probably already have songs or no songs. Just in case you didn't, there's some helpful children's songs in there in case you ever need to use those. But we just need to remember our goal is to teach all children the biblical principles right out of the Bible that are behind, the, uh, behind any rules that we have, any rules that we have, all of this. And some of this comes from our camp, our camp manual. So now we're kind of talking about campers. But whether it comes from clothing or what, whatever it is, we have to realize that everything we teach them needs to come from the Bible because if we start teaching them things not from the Bible, they're going to start to, it will start to affect their view on God, on church. And so isn't it a waste of time if you and I try to teach people things that aren't in the Bible? What are, what are we? We're a church, right? We want to teach them things that are in the Bible. We want to teach them things that they can apply. Now, um, in that, there's a lot of different things we can talk about, but um, you're not always going to like how a young person is dressed, right? Now, I know I believe in modesty. We should always do our best, but that compassion aspect comes in too, because uh, I went to when I was in Christian school. It was still in the manual not to wear wired rim glasses. Like we weren't supposed to. Well. That's not technically in the Bible, right? I don't think that's a big thing anymore. I think you have wired rim, right? I kind of, I kind of have a little bit of both. But that, that's kind of the thing. There are going to be times where maybe you're like, oh, do you see what they're, they're wearing? They, they, have a, uh, they came with a cutoff, and that's just horrible, wicked, evil. Well, uh, we don't necessarily have Scripture to say, well, you can't wear so if it has a rip on it or whatever. Now, I do think... Obviously, they can't come to where they're super modest and, you know, if, if they're not wearing clothes. You're like, oh, well, we have to be. Well, but Bible's clear on things like that, right? But we're talking about like th- specific things that sometimes is more of a preference and more of a, um, what you've decided. And if we if that's the gist of what we teach, a lot of times we're going to lose them. Right. Again, I'm be, I know I'm being vague on that, but a lot of my experience is trying to help kids regardless of their backgrounds and there's so many times where people say do this or that but it's not actually in the bible we have to teach them what's what's in the bible if you you show them god first and a lot of that can come come after that and so it's so important and i'm so thankful that your church wants to reach young people wants to reach children doing this youth rally on friday hopefully this was a help to some of you hopefully it could be a just some helpful tips and tricks principles that you could look back to um I know we're, we're over time, but does anyone have anything to mention or anything to add to that? Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity, preacher. And uh, I'll, I'll let you close then.